Hello, and welcome to the Five of the Week. We are a weekly recap show for the NCAA, and we go through a Five of the Week. It is not the Five of the Week. This week, we have a lot to go through, but first, let me introduce to you my co-host of the show. Hello, I'm Danger Golding. I'm the AD of the West Virginia Mountaineers. Our first of the week is Shockers at Hoosiers, which happened in game day two. Uh, Shockers ended up losing to the Hoosiers 98-86, to but the biggest talking point of this evening was every single Hoosier player that hit the court uh, scored in double digits, actually. So seven players with double digits scoring in that game. Uh, Jackson, yeah, that's, a, that's, yeah. a, that's something that's not really common to see at the NCAA level. There's not many teams that has that much depth on the bench. Usually you'd see something along the lines of one or two star players providing all the scoring. And that's what we saw on the other side of the court in the Shockers. They had uh, Detroit Velvet Smooth, the, the Shocker small forward, who hit 36 points. But uh, in, the, in the Shocker side, only three players got over double digits. So that's a more the traditional style of offense that we tend to see in the NCAA. The Susia team is might be something special. Definitely, thank you. Jackson, the point guard position had 17, 9, and 6. Uh, uh, says 5. 17, 9, and 5. 17, yeah, 9, five. and 5, yeah. And uh, Chabot off the bench had 13, 6, and 5 in only 29 minutes of gameplay. So, as you if said, you, massive you death. If you look at the box score, the Hoosiers actually had some very balanced passing. It looks like they've they're they're implanting everyone into this passing style of play. So everyone down the roster is getting assists from the power forward who got five, small forward got four, the shooting guard got three. So it's a very like ball movement orientated offense they're running over there in Indiana. A big portion of their field goals were assisted, so 36 of their made field goals of of those 36, 27 were assisted, and as you said, they were spread all over the court and bench as well. So, good, good, good performance by the Hoosiers, and this definitely looks like a template that you can build on. Yeah, this this is looking very strong, and it's amazing the efficiency they got out of their shots as well. They had nine less shots than the Shockers, but hitting them at 55% from the field is a good recipe for success. Yeah. It also helps. One key part was a, a bit of a shocking night from uh, Stefan Williams, the Wichita center. He only hit two of his 13 field goals. But So you could say Indiana got a bit lucky with an off-shooting night, but you could also say that their good defense inside prevented a lot of easy shots from going up. Yes, and they 12 of the uh, 12 of 23 from three point land for the Hoosiers as well. So all in all a great performance and something to really be proud of. That is our first of the week. Uh, we'll head on over to the second of the week uh, which we kind of touched on already so some statistical trends around the league thus far is there something you personally have noticed uh, early on that has caught your eye or have they been just one off one thing that i've noticed is uh looking at the playoff standings we we tend to see a lot of teams running very high pace offenses and they're usually the teams that see the most success but this year we're, we're getting, seeing a bit of a different thing the Ducks are coming in, and they're not scoring particularly high per game, and but they're also their defense is very on point. I think this is partly due to just the talent on the roster, but also they're running a, a slow-paced offense, which isn't something we tend to see that much in the NCAA. But it's not just them that's doing that. It looks like the second-place uh, Villanova team is similar, and uh, quite a few of the teams up the top are running relatively slower pace compared to past years, which is an interesting change of style. And the numbers 
support that as well. Uh, after 12 games, it could typically be considered the cutoff mark for hot starts and uh, early streaks to just turn into seasonal trends or to fall off completely and just stay as hot starts. So um, the league-wide pace has risen actually a bit. So I would I would think there's now less parity around the league. Top and bottom are both closer to each other in scoring and in the and in defense. Um, yeah, I think I'd agree with that. Scoring's uh, fairly looking good around the league. There's not too many teams that are uh, floundering too much on offense. Obviously, there's a few the uh, Huskies, Wildcats, Mountaineers. Some of these teams down at the bottom that are not scoring due to either like poor field goal, field goal percentage, or just a combination of that and some low pace. I think we're going to have an exciting season ahead, especially with this big bumper crop of freshmen. So I don't think necessarily the uh, early records of these teams will reflect how they're, they're going to be looking going into March. Uh, as a Duke player, I would be thankful for that. Uh, speaking of Duke, uh, they, I believe, led the league in team scoring last season. So there's their volume and efficiency was kind of an anomaly to pull the ceiling even higher but uh, now that uh, that sort of a super team has not been established yet at least uh, maybe the league is more even across the board uh, yeah i'd agree with that the uh, top end of talent isn't quite as like astonishing as last year obviously we had the maryland team which was superb and the really high-powered Duke team. But one thing to note about Duke this season is that though they have about league average scoring-wise, they're in the top four of defense, and that's one of the and that's completely built on uh, the culture that we know and love with Duke is their stealing game. They're leading the league in steals per game at nine point five, whereas the second-place team is only on eight point three. Second in blocks as well. Second in blocks as well. So the, the hallmark of a, a Shaka led team was steals and, and good defense, good fundamentals. And that's the kind of thing that I think is good, we're going to see continued in Duke. So defense comes first in Duke, and defense obviously leads to good offense after all. And or about three point attempts, they were a bit lower than last season. So far, in Sunday, on Sunday, uh, even though the prolific bombers such as Detres Puntos and McGee Sachs are still holding up their percentages, maybe their attempts are a little bit below their last season. But uh, our scoring leader for the first week is a front court player, and also our fifth highest scorer. A robotastic prime, uh, Arthur Hugo need being the number one there, is a front court player. So maybe that shift towards front court powerhouses, even though we were anticipating a kind of a rise of two guards, maybe that also uh, could quicken the pace and still somehow lower the scoring as there are not that many three point attempts. Yeah, well, this season we're seeing a bit of a, a balanced range of positions in the in the top scorers. Last season, there were heavily shooting guards, obviously uh, Max Winchester right at the top. And there was a few few big men at the top, like uh, Rayful and Armstrong, but largely it seemed to be backcourt dominated. Uh, we're seeing a bit more of a range. There's a few forwards in there. Obviously, uh, Hugo Nitt, the Spartan center right at the top. And uh, Robotastic Prime, another top talent in Gonzaga. I believe John Connor as well as a power forward. So we're seeing a, a mix of positions up there in the top 10 this year. Speaking of high scoring, we'll move on to our next topic. Uh, our third topic of the week. The amount of 40-point scorers so far in the league 
is to say amazing uh, a lot of high personal statistical feats so far in our league and uh, a couple of players like Finn Zengline and then Hugo Nitt and Robotastic Prime of whom we spoke of earlier have hit the 40 point mark this season uh, what do you think is the limit uh, what uh, do you think there are records to be broken on single game performances or scoring averages this season well i think we've seen a lot of players step up for their teams and hit these big scoring marks there's a lot of uh, high scoring talent around the league and uh, especially Hugo Nitt, part of the reason he's managed to score a whopping 31 points a game is because despite being a big, he's staying in the game for a long time. He's got the fourth most minutes in the league, 38.8, which is unusual to see from someone. Though, whether it's because he's not contesting shots and getting into foul trouble, that might be part of why the Spartans have a bad defence. But if he's putting up 31 points a game... Not sure the uh, coach is going to be too worried about what he's doing on the other side of the court. A lot of talent, and uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of young players as well in the league that don't tend to focus on defense. Usually, uh, freshmen are going to come into the league a bit raw on that side. Hence, the reason why we might be seeing quite a few more forty-point games early in the season. Yeah, early in the season. Uh, I'm sure that we won't see quite as many explosions as teams start to tighten up on defence, get their freshmen working on that side of the court. But early on, I think we could see quite a few players go off. And we already have. Yes, establishing a defensive game plan is the key to stopping these kinds of supreme feats of scoring. So <clears throat> we talked about Hugo Nitt extensively now. Uh, Hugo Nitt, as you said, the center for the Michigan State Spartans, 38.7 minutes per game, 31.2 points per game, uh, three 40 point games uh, versus Tar Heels, versus Hoyas, and versus the Huskies. He's shown that he can get these games against some like decent teams he hasn't uh managed to really do it uh, against super top defenses so far but i'm sure that might be just a uh, not too much of a problem he's still scoring obviously like plus 30 plus against these good teams uh, being able to style on these lesser teams while impressive at the moment it might not be the most worthwhile thing when it comes to March, when you're going to be facing better defense. Uh, some of the other 40-point scorers, <clears throat> Robotastic Prime of the Gonzaga Bulldogs, 42-12 and 12 in a 94-89 loss against the Cavaliers. Finn Zengline and Joey Hatfield both hit 40-point marks in a game versus Syracuse, to make it even more crazy, they couldn't, after all, drag their team into a victory, losing just by one point, one o seven to one o six. Yeah, that's a that's a pretty crazy stat. When you have two teammates that combine for eighty nine points, you'd expect them to win. But whether it's their teammates that need to step up and put that little bit of extra in, or maybe just the, the fatigue from having to get so many shots up was uh, affecting them towards the end of games. But it's a bit worrying if you're not scoring, either if you can't pull out a game where your two stars are going off like that, whether it's a, a case of perhaps needing to focus on defence a bit more or spread out your shots so your star players aren't too tired. It's, it's something the coach might have to figure out going forwards. It would be truly unbelievable to see two around top 20 scorers in the league in one of the worst teams record-wise. Uh, so the full stat line for Zheng line was uh, 49, 9 and 6. And Hatfield also scored a double-double, 40 and 11. Other 40-point scorers so far 
uh, Anthony Caramello of the Syracuse Orange, Detroit Velvet Smooth of the Wichita, Wichita State Shockers, 42 points against the Huskies, Junior Jackson of the Arizona Wildcats scored 43 versus the Georgetown Hoyas, also added 9 assists there, so a beautiful stat line for him as well. Yeah. In addition to that, uh, Patrick Felter of the Kansas Jayhawks scored 40 points versus Villanova with 10 of 14 shooting from three point range. Uh, John Connor exploded to the highest uh, single game total so far this season with 53 points versus the Mountaineers as um, that ended their three game losing streak and they won that game 110 to 102 in overtime needing every one of his points there. Uh, DeAndre Paxter from Virginia got 45 versus Kansas. Chase Clout from UCLA got 43 and 14 versus the Longhorns. And Amari Creed of the Mountaineers got 46 versus the Gonzaga Bulldogs. So some real, some players really stepping up and getting a few extra wins for their team there. Exactly. And uh, also Matteo Werner of the Florida Gators scored 40 versus the Fighting Irish. Uh, could you talk uh, a bit about the impact you've seen this season so far from Creed to the Mountaineers? Well, Creed's been making pretty huge steps recently. Uh, this off season, he's he's gone close to his uh, true potential as a ball handler. Uh, it's mainly efficiency that we've been working on the, over the off season, and I think in the coming weeks, he's he's really turned the corner, and we're going to see some. Pretty big games from him. Uh, he probably won't be hitting those super high heights again as the uh, as our centre Ivancic is becoming more of a score in these recent weeks. He's gonna previously he's been an exclusively defensive focus centre, but he's he's gonna be included more on the offense. So you may not see Creed explode for that higher point total again, but he's definitely gonna still be a, a key focal point of the offense. You also mentioned John Connor's 53-point performance. They beat the Mountaineers 110-102 to in overtime. Uh, the Hoyas went into the game 6-7, uh, and seven, I believe, in the win-loss column. And Connor had one of those performances you just can't help but admire. Like a um, real old-school inside big man playing with no three-point attempts he had a 21 of 30 shooting night uh, Sean Stockton also checked out with 14 helpers to his name and center star Burns had 20 points to his name so you could say it was a bit of a team performance but obviously you're not gonna take anything away from someone who scored 53 yeah, you'd usually in uh, games like this, you see one player scoring and the rest of the team not stepping up so much. Uh, not really the case in this game. Uh, the rest of their team had their shots and shot them pretty efficiently. Efficiently. Uh, one of the big benefits that the Hoyas had in this game was the sheer amount of fouls they they got and foul calls. They had 51 free throws on the night and managed to foul out quite a few of the Mountaineers players. Four rejections, so playing... was it? Uh, yeah, that was uh, Ezekiel Bridges, Jace Brawley, Creed, Mills, and Harry Anders all fouling out. So Oof. quite a few players, only two starters managing to stay in the game the whole time. So they were they did very well to play against, go inside and draw a ton of fouls. And the game could have been over a lot sooner if Starburns unfortunately had a uh, poor shooting night, going four of sixteen from the charity stripe, but they did they did take it into overtime, and I think the the shimmer, the fouls they got, and the extra rest from the free throw line meant that the Hoyas were going in with a bit more energy. And that's why, despite uh, finishing obviously tied at the end of regulation in the OT period, Georgetown took it pretty easily, going twelve and four in OT and securing the game. An incredible performance all in all. Big shout outs to John Connor. And with John Connor in rap, we'll move on to 
our our final topic of the week uh the michigan state spartans they have some of the most prolific scorers in the league so far but still have some work to do on the other side of the ball yeah you'd expect them to see with the generally the team with the highest score on the nation is going to be pretty high up there in record but it does seem that maybe they've just focused a bit too much on the offensive side i mean getting buckets is always good but you're going to have you're always going to have some nights where the other team is just going to abuse that lack of defense and outscore you so it's tough to say maybe we'll see some development on that side of the ball going forwards or maybe it's it's always hard to say this early in the season they might have just had a a poor run against some really good teams and we'll see that that points allowed drop back down to the level you should expect of a top team some some statistics of the first week uh, defensive rebounding gives a perspective on their ball retention uh, 24th dead last in the league uh, field goal percentage against 0.485 so that was 20th best and points per taken shot against also 20th best 1.27 they also allow allowed the highest amount of offensive rebounds 11.0 per game so that rebounding game under your own basket really really has to improve if they look to make best usage of their offensive game yeah, and especially with a uh, a one of the best PGs in the league at the moment in Jad McPherson, getting him the ball uh, early on is going to really help in those fast break opportunities because he's going to be able to really create some space on the break. So you really want to be getting those defensive rebounds, turning around and charging up the court as soon as you can with such a talented playmaker. I think I want one more thing to mention is uh, speaking of Jad McPherson, slightly interesting stat at the moment. He is actually averaging 40.2 minutes a game, which is more than obviously a normal game suggests. So he's been very good at avoiding any foul trouble. But one thing you might say causes that is that the Spartans haven't been having many blowout games as they're, they're not getting a chance to rest their starters as much as some other top teams would be. Also, we're, we're seeing, in regards to records, we're seeing the uh, Duke PG, Miles Lefebvre, on 11, a huge amount of assists, 11 a game. When when the second person has 9.3, you can see how far ahead of the pack he is in regards to distributing the ball. Trying his hardest to follow in Belisario Sanavioz's footsteps, uh... So that wraps up our five of the week. Uh, thank you everyone so much for listening. Thank you, Danger Golding. Always a pleasure. And we'll look forward to catching you next week. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>